Good morning, everyone. I thank you for joining us for this OSLC webcast, Should I Link or Should I Sync, presented by Matt Bergland, uh, Enterprise Architect at Ericsson. I think this is a very interesting topic, and I hope you will find it interesting, too. My name is Sean Kennedy. I'm the OSLC Community Development Leader for IBM. I'm also the Operations Coordinator for the OSLC Steering Committee. Now, I know this is a great webcast, and we will be getting into it, but before we do, in the spirit of all these kinds of presentations, I'm going to take you through some things that you didn't sign up to hear first, and that's just because I've got your attention and I'm going to use and abuse it. So firstly, I assume many of you already are familiar with OSLC, Open Services for Lifecycle Collaboration. What I'm showing now is our is our website, and if you've been there before, you will see that it has been updated a little bit, especially the home page. And we hit on the key points and the reasons why we're doing the work at OSLC. We're trying to make integrations easier. The integration problem is difficult and has been very sticky and expensive to solve. So we're trying to make it easier and less expensive. We're trying to do it with a robust and flexible integration, a loosely coupled way of doing integration, you know, based on the architecture of the web. This will help us get more data out there so we can do more with the data, not so much about connecting tools as exposing data to additional services that may be provided across the enterprise, such as search or uh, analytics or reporting. And to do all this, we gather industry experts uh, from all over, and you may be one of the industry experts that we need to participate. So participation is actually fairly easy to do, and it in some ways became easier with some recent news, uh, OSLC taking the specification work to OASIS to go on the formal standards track there. Our specifications are minimal minimalistic, and we try to do just enough and iterate over that so that um, what you see in say OSLC V2, which is the latest final specs today, is an advancement over what was there in the first, but we could still get things done. You know, some basic scenarios were enabled even with the first issues of OSLC specs. And as I mentioned, we're inspired by the web. Everything we've done has been implemented, and that is helped by the fact that the specifications are small, and it's easy to digest, and then ultimately easy to implement and uh, test. There are test suites available. I'll show you where you can find them in a minute. But if you actually create a OSLC provider, there already exists a suite of JUnit tests that you can point at that provider and see how well your implementation has done. And you'll find those test suites as well as other things to help you with your implementation, including libraries for Java, uh, some, some toolkits for Perl, as well as uh, .NET libraries available at Eclipse Leo and also at uh, OSLC for NET, which is a CodeFlex project. As I mentioned, we have the test suites. We also have reference implementations. So when you're first getting started, you can actually pull up a reference implementation, pull up a test suite, uh, have them run against each other, and watch what happens. And you can learn very quickly that way. Uh, Eclipse Leo is a great resource. As I mentioned, we are going uh, with OSLC specification development to OASIS. And what I'm showing you here are the 22 companies that are co-founders of the member section we created at OASIS. If you want to learn more about that in particular, there are a few blog posts on the OSLC website, and I'm looking at one of them right, right now. And I think we have a really good uh, cross-section of participation from enterprise end users like Ericsson um, uh, vendors like uh, IBM, obviously I work at IBM. Um, we have uh, we have universities involved, academic academia, and we also have uh, integrators uh, such as uh, Accenture. There are a number of presentations coming up. We have the one today. Uh, should I link or should I sync? There's if you're interested in doors. Uh, IBM team is running a webcast about requirements-driven ver verification and validation using OSLC. There's uh, the OASIS member section virtual kickoff is on the 27th at 10 a.m. Eastern, and at 11 a.m. Eastern, the uh, cloud customer, 
Cloud Standards Customer Council, CSCC, is having a webcast about DevOps in the cloud, and that's all being enabled using OSLC. So now, without further ado, I would like to turn over the, the uh, webcast to our presenter, Matt, and uh, Matt will be needing to tell me when I need to advance the slides, so we'll be hearing next or click as we go along. Matt, welcome. Thank you, Sean. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning in North America, good afternoon in Europe, or wherever you are in, in, on the universe. So uh, uh, I'm Matt Berglund. I'm working as an enterprise architect within the CIO office of Ericsson, uh, which means that uh, we are uh, looking at the uh, IT infrastructures and the tools landscape for the entire corporation of Ericsson. Uh, I have a special focus on R&D and have also an R&D background um, into software systems development and software testing. So uh, what I would like to tell you today is a bit of the story uh, which has its roots in uh, uh, some experience we've had in Ericsson on how to integrate tools using OSLC. Uh, and uh, recently at the IBM Innovate conference, I presented a, a, a use case where we first developed with a sync strategy and took a link strategy later on and are again investigating if we need to have a combination of both or where are we going. But I will not really go into our details on, on that journey, but I will uh, create a more uh, uh, fictive uh, scenario for you uh, where I will go through some challenges of the different uh, and pros and cons of doing synchronization or linking. So if you take the next slide, please. So click again. So I would like to introduce you to my four persons of this uh, uh, scenery. So we have Patrick here. Patrick is a project manager, uh, but he's actually more than a project manager. He is also a bit of a product manager or product owner since he's working with uh, responsibilities like requirements management and portfolio management, which is more a product manager role. And he's also into managing the time plan and roadmap, the progress and the follow-up of the project that he is running. So Patrick, he loves really to have roll-up dashboards from the subordinate units that he has full control over what goes on in the project. Click. Then we have a development team. Uh, Diana is the development team leader. She's running a cross-functional team uh, according to Agile practices. They're both system architects, software designers, software testers, and system testers in this team. Uh, this team is particularly concerned about uh, working Agile. That means that they love Scrum. Click again. Uh, we have just another team. It's in, in uh, one way quite similar to the first team because it's also a cross-functional team. It's led by Maria, but it's a maintenance team. So they're working with fixing bugs that are found primarily uh, with customers and uh, resolving earlier versions of, of the product. Uh, and since they're working more in maintenance, they're very much favoring uh, the lean practices and, and loves Kanban. Using Kanban boards is the, the, the favorite thing for this team. So, so these three are a simplified version of a typical project. Of course, in Ericsson, they scale to many, many teams, and sometimes there are projects and sub-projects. Um, and the roles may shift around, not necessarily having these names. They could be called product owners, scrum masters, and other things. So there's yet the fourth person here, and I click again. This is uh, the IT person. Ingrid, working at the IT department, is responsible for all the ALM tools that the different projects uses. So the, the tools she is managing is the agile planning tools, the life cycle tools for, for instance, reporting and dashboards. Mm -hmm. She is also running the software design tools for integrated development environment, debugging, etc and as well as the software configuration management build and test tools. The IT person has a big 
challenge with how things doesn't really work out in, in this project. So they, they really hate when tools does not integrate well and they would um, prefer life to be simpler. And this is really my background. I'm from the CIO office and the IT group and that's where we see the challenges with a bit of sometimes strange setups in tooling. So with those four persons as a background, I will now go through five stages and five more detailed things. Take the next slide. So I will move through those five steps, going from total chaos to a bit more streamlined way of working. Uh, I will then focus on what I call man managed diversity, when we have many different tools, and there I will look into the sync strategy. Uh, then taking it to the next level, which I call efficient flexibility, where the link strategy will be examined a bit. And last but not least, the life cycle utopia. Um, yeah, you will know when we get there what I mean by that. And as you can see by the, the, the checkboxes, we will get more and more things standardized and in common as we go through this journey. So let's start the journey with the total chaos. And I will show you two slides. Take the next slide, please. And click. So in the total chaos scenery, I want to go a bit deeper into what type of tools the different teams and roles are using. And as you can see here, the development team, they have a tool. It's called Tool A. And I have simplify what the tool consists of by three logical boxes here. One box called the user interface, and in this particular case, this tool comes with two different types of user interfaces. It comes with a web user interface for the average usage and an, an IDE user interface for programming purposes. Um, then the tool itself has a set of capabilities and logics. This particular tool deals with three things. It deals with managing work, and work is represented by a backlog. So it has a number of work items in a certain priority order. So its the capability in the tool is to do agile planning using backlogs. Another capability in this tool, and also logic connected to that, is managing test cases and the status of test executions. How did it go? How did the test go? So it uh, knows if the test was passed or failed. And then there is also a bit of defect management in this tool. Uh, it can manage a flow of defects, so defects will go from review to corrected through certain checkpoints. For instance, checking if the CCB, Change Control Board, has been involved in the process. Also, the tool, to do those three capabilities, it has data connected to it. So it has a set of data for work items, for test cases, and defects representing those three capabilities and logics on top there. And as you can see, a typical uh, data has some type of ID, some type of slogan, and then it has a state, dependent on what uh, is the subject above. Everything here is extremely oversimplified from reality, and um, I just wanted to go through this first tool a bit more detail so you get the concept of, of how you can think about the tool. Now, let's, in, let's look into the maintenance team. Click again. We'll see how they, they, their world is looking. So the maintenance team, of course, couldn't agree with the development team on what tools to use. And there's good reasons for that, because the maintenance team, they have been around a bit longer. They have um, uh, other things that are their priorities, and they have to go with two different tools, tool B and tool C. Um, tool C is a typical, uh, take it backwards, a typical uh, ticket management tool. So instead of working with defects, they're working with customer tickets, and they have a tool working with that. Now, this tool has slightly different uh, flow logic compared to tool A, and it has also slightly different uh, namings in the data of the same uh, type of thing uh, as you would have in the defect 
in Thule. So here they just call it number, name, and impact in the data instead of ID, slogan, and severity. They also use a, a some kind of task tool, but since they are a Kanban, uh, fav, favor Kanban, they are much more looking into throughput rather than backlog. So they, they look at the work in progress uh, levels and uh, capabilities in the team. Also, they're dealing with tests here, but they have not the same states. They will have red, yellow, and green as their favorite states for describing the, the, the status of a test case and the result of a test case. So, as you can see, development team, maintenance team, they've selected two slightly different set of tools with different capabilities and logics. And now take the next slide. Thank you. So, the project manager, he also named as product manager, he's working with two different types of tools. Tool D, which is a requirements or uh, customer demand tool. So the tool where you're managing your portfolio and thinking about what type of demands or needs are there in the market, very high level requirements, main requirements, and they want here that tool has a capability of, of doing business cases and weighting the different requirements against each other, having a bit of a voting mechanism. And again, there is a set of data for representing main requirements. But it's, again, slightly different from what you saw in the earlier tools. And this manager also wants to see what goes on. As you remember, he loves roll-up dashboards. So this manager has a data warehousing tool that provides uh, both in the web UI and in the Android UI, which is on the cell phone, capabilities to view uh, current progress, current quality status, and what is the release uh, uh, path for, for the project. So it gives the capabilities to, to the project leaders to see everything that goes on there. Uh, to, to see progress, it really needs to follow up what work has been done. To see quality, it's a mix of work done connected to requirements that has been implemented by test cases and bugs being fixed. It's a combined report. So those are the needs of the project and product manager. Then we have the fourth guy. Please click. This is the poor IT support person. The IT support person is very confused of what to do. They, it's immediately realizes that the number of things are not lining up. For instance, uh, the methods around Scrum is not the same as those in Kanban. The status of past is different from what green means. It could be the same thing, but it could also be different things. Requirements may be different from what an uh, Agile epic is. Tickets, not necessarily the same thing as a defect. Uh, a state the machine may not differ from another state machine, or a logical process flow may differ from another logical process flow, which is used in another tool. So the IT support guy doesn't really know what to do about this. It's a mess. Normally what happens at this stage is that the project, in some way, turns to the IT organization and says, we have certain integration needs. Could you please help us to integrate tool A to tool B, and the tool B to tool D, and this starts to becoming point-to-point -point integration for different types of artifacts in the tool. And that's fine as long as there's one or two point-to-point -point integrations, but in most organizations, already in this small scenario, you will have five different tools involved, and there are like uh, eight or 10 different artifact types, some similar, some slightly different, that needs to connect together. And already there, it's starting to explode. And now imagine we have multiple teams, or if we have even multiple projects, this become a, a daunting task for the IT support to deal with. And it's a headache. So that's what we start off from. That's the total chaos situation. Now we will improve a bit, so we'll take the next slide. 
And we'll talk about a bit on streamlining the way you're working. So if you click up two more. Right. So we have now the project manager, development team, and the maintenance team. So even before starting to figure out how can we get things aligned with getting tools integrated, there are certain things that can be eased only by agreeing on how we work in projects. It is not necessarily the most healthy thing that each team and a part of this, the project has decided to go with different strategies to solve the same problem. So the project manager that needs to see progress is a bit concerned that one group works with Scrum and the other one with Kanban. There's two different metaphors of representing progress. So one first thing to do could be to streamline to have one set of methods in the project. So if you click the next one, they agree on cutting out the Kanban way of working and agree on the Scrum way of working in the project. Click again. And instead, the maintenance team will also work with backlog. And by some manual tweaking with Excel sheets, the product manager will now be able to collect the work items that has been done in the two different teams and roll that up to a progress report of a burned on short type. Of course, it includes a set of manual work or some scripts that pulls data from the backlogs into Excel and from Excel to, to a chart. But it's doable. So this is the first level of alignment we probably need to do uh, to some degree to just get some order in, in our project landscape. Now, don't take this as I'm not saying that you can't run Kanban and, and Scrum at the same time. Of course, they can be used for different contexts, but it's a bit of oversimplification here. So, but the message is some level of streamlining on how we work is healthy. Let's, let's now go to the third level. Take the next slide. Manage diversity. So we have the development team. Click the next one and the maintenance team. There are certain differences in how the development team does compared to the maintenance team. So let's take the click again and we get the pair of binoculars coming in here. So if we zoom in on the, the logic part of the two different set of tools that are decided by the two teams, we can see that the test states agreed on in the development team differs from the test states that the maintenance team has agreed on. Also, the flow for defects differs from the flow of tickets that the maintenance team has agreed on. I guess you're already now starting to ask yourself, why did the team differentiate so much? Is this healthy? And I can see two different trends uh, going on in the company we are working in sometimes the organization are quite strong up front to agree on ways of working and, 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 and also the metadata and the states you're using. Uh, but since Agile and Lean talks about people over processes and tools, as one of the first things in the Agile Manifesto, we have seen a tendency that we go quite all in and blindly into embracing Agile and ask the team to be a very innovative and try out their way of working and also allow them to be in in their retrospectives able to improve their way of working, which means that they sometimes also change business logic in their tool or their project area of the tool. Because it should be noticed that because one team has selected a tool and if even the other team would select the same tool, they could still end up having different logics because the tools of today are so configurable that one project area uh, in the same tool could be configured totally different compared to another project area in exactly the same tool. So this challenge is not only when we have two different tools, whereas in this case there's actually three different tools involved. So what to do about it? Well, let's uh, look at what the Sync tool could offer. So click again. So. Let's see, if we, if we 
install a synchronization tool uh, of some, some of the tools that are out on the market. That would take data from one tool and synchronize it with the other tool so that both tools are kept up to date with the information from the other tool. What, what that requires is some type, some type of mapping table or like an uh, ETL type of strategy where the data is mapped. So, for instance, path means green, fail means red, and yellow will also mean failed, but it's not necessarily bidirectional. So that's a way of, of telling the sync tool how to interpret the logic from t one tool to the other tool and vice versa. Same thing goes for processes. And uh, the good thing is that it's, it, it actually allows those tools to coexist in parallel besides each other. And there are sometimes really strong reasons for having different tools. It could be that the customer ticket handling tool must be there because it serves a different purpose compared to the development team's more defect and bug tracking tool. So uh, it, it goes from a bit of more high ceremony management to a bit of low ceremony, and perhaps you need both of those in a project. Now, some of these sync tools, not all of them, also has its own database or at least a cache and that enables certain level of uh, reporting or even process enactment to happen from within the sync tool. Or that it provides ability that the arrow going up to another dashboarding data warehouse environment to suck out data from the sync uh, uh, tool rather than the source databases. There's pros and cons with having data also in the sync tool. In one way, it get, you get yet another place where data could uh, cause you some challenges. But that is one strategy one could have. Let's see on some of the pros and cons on the next slide. So I divided the pros and cons in two groups. One is the pros and cons for the user organizations and one for the IT uh, support. So for the product and team members, uh, what would, is really good about the, the synchronization strategy is that it's tool vendor agnostic. Um, you, you will not uh, have to uh, go with a specific integration framework from any of those vendors. Instead, you rely on the synchronization tool to do the synchronization business. However, a backside of that could be that you get now locked into the synchronization vendor instead. So that's a bit of a trade-off to do there, uh, dependence on the synchronization vendor or on uh, platform vendors. Um, but there are also some positive effects, again, of using a synchronization. Uh, you could now have, since data is synchronized between the different tools, your favorite tool will now have all the data, which means that reports and dashboard within that tool can be easily made because you have all the data at hand within the, your own tool of, that you favor. Um, on the other side, that could potentially mean to, that you will end up with very many mapping tables. In the example I just gave, there was only two teams and still some artifacts that needed to be mapped. Imagine you have many teams that are allowed to have different uh, ways of uh, working with, with metadata and, and states and processes. Then it could potentially become quite many mappings just only within one project and if you have many projects, that multiplies. And there will be a bit of a challenge to maintain those mapping tables over time. Um, then, the good thing again is that the possibility to have a point of one single point where you can have process enactment and reporting if the sync tool in itself has an own database. Not all of them does, but if it has, then that can be accomplished. Or if it has a cache, perhaps that can be used in some way to suck out data for, for some kind of instant reporting from more than one source. 
Um, then I would like to touch on something which I highlighted a bit higher and also gave an example on, which I gave a warning sign here, because in Ericsson we saw this happening. The risk when you do copy is that you also start thinking of, should we also copy the capabilities of the other tool into my favorite tool? Because copying data, that's, that's good. Then you get the data in, 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 so you can access it. But as, since you've copied the data there, probably you will also want to do the same things that the other tool could do in your favorite tool. So, for instance, add the weighting mechanism into your favorite tool, or you could extend the state machine of red, yellow, green also with fail and pass and make them intertwined in some way. So you have both of the two behaviors in one and the same tool. And that is really dangerous because what it will lead to is a function, well, a functionality explosion that every tool will get requirements to fulfill the capabilities of the other tools. Or what we also learned was that we failed doing that, so we got in some in-between state. We got some of the features or capabilities, but not all of them. And then it's a really strange environment where you, in one way of working, you get only part of it, and in the other one, you get another more full, complete set of it. Then, for the tool, uh, the IT guy, uh, there's very many good things here. There are many adapters for different tools available out of the box. So, and those integration vendors, they are, this is their bread and butter, so they're quite willing to add support also for other tools. Um, and the, the, the adapters are kept up to date, so when a new tool comes out on the market with a new version, uh, we have seen that uh, they are quite fast in picking up and adapting to the adapters towards that tool. And that's a good thing because adapters is painful, and if you can have a vendor doing that for you, that's a great thing, uh, instead of doing that in your own company for each point-to-point -point integration. The minor side, data du duplication is always uh, uh, a challenge. You may end up with data in multiple sources, and if they come out of sync, uh, you could have challenges to get them back up uh, healthy again. Now, most of these uh, sync tools comes with good caching mechanisms, so that is not necessarily a big problem, but it should also be considered as a, a, an aspect. And there is also a license fee connected to the synchronization tools. That should be kept in mind. And that has to be balanced with the pros and the cons. So, Take the next slide and we move into uh, efficient flexibility and click, I think we can click uh, two times more. So again, we have the project manager, the development team, and the maintenance team. And uh, in this scenario, I will now start explaining how you could use a linking strategy to accomplish similar things that we had in the previous scenario. So in this case, I've shown that the project manager is working with the demand tool, the, the needs and requirement, main requirement management tool. Uh, the development team is using some kind of backlog uh, and, and, and the task management tool, and same thing does the maintenance team. So first thing to notice is that in this scenario, the data on the lowest level has a minimal set of data harmonized. So instead of calling it the title, slogan, heading, or anything else, they are all using the same set of terminology. And, and uh, uh, that terminology comes from the concept around OSLC. seed. But, but first, before going there, I need to ask uh, Sean to click again. And I want to show you how each tool actually provides information in its user interface. So the data of the tool, all of its different tools, it comes from the data source, goes through its capabilities, and is um, then ex uh, exposed through the user interface for the end user. So uh, 
As you know, we were using OSLC to link data. Click again. That would mean that the, the, the main requirement data, the work item data, and the task data in the three tools are linked together. There has been some effort by the users to, to connect the, the work item and the task and the main requirements that are re relevant to link together. And it's really a good use case because the main requirement is in an ideal pro approach perhaps relatively similar to an epic while you may keep stories and tasks in your, in your different team uh, backlogs. Or you may have, again, using the term of main requirements on the product management level, but then using epic story tasks on the team level. It depends a bit on your strategy there. But, but there is a reason to be able to trace from the custom requirements all the way down to the work that actually is supposed to implement the requirement. So, if we are now using the link strategy with OSLC, OSLC then comes with the capabilities called UI Delegate and also something called Rich Hovering. And if you click again, I will show here what it means to do UI Delegate. So, if you're using tool A and are uh, examining the link around a particular work item, and that work item has relationship to data, uh, objects, artifacts in the other tools. The, what the UI delegate will do is that it will show exactly the same UI that you have in the other tool, but embedded in your own tool. So in the tool A will now suddenly get to see the UI of tool B and the UI of tool D, not necessarily at the same time, but dependent on how you click. And the good thing about this is that you will be able to operate the other tool remotely. And if you have, for instance, a work item in the development tool, team tool, tool A, and a defect in tool B that are linked together, uh, you do not need to repeat or copy the data over to tool A. It can reside within tool B. Neither do you need to copy its capabilities of doing backlogs or waiting as you have in tool D. That will all execute in the remote tool, and the capabilities are not copied in any sense or try to be mimicked within the own tool. Instead, all those capabilities are remotely accessed through the UI delegate. So that's very nice. And this is one of the beauties around OSLC, that it has this UI delegate capability. Or if you just hover over a link, it will give you this uh, uh, rich hovering and showing some of the metadata immediately. Take uh, one more thing before we take the next slide. Uh, Another thing you would get from here as well, if you now have all your data uh, using the same set of uh, uh, least, uh, small agreement of what the data means, which OSLC does, uh, that is enabling data warehousing to be much more simpler. Instead of collecting all the data from the three different sources here, transforming them into a new format and agree on that format, you can instead roll up the data immediately because an apple is an apple is an apple in this scenario. And that means that strategy is that actually only uses an index to present a dashboard rather than having a copy of the data and the data is remaining in, the, in, in each tool is now feasible. And uh, as an example, we can name the IBM Realm product, which, which does that. And there are some other uh, tools doing slightly the same thing. So you will get the instant data. It's not used for trending, but for instant data, you, it, it's good, because you have the same understanding of the data. But again, there are some pros and cons, so we'll take the next slide. Oh, well, this one was first. I guess since you are in an OSLC workshop now, you are to some extent familiar with OSLC. If you wouldn't be very short on OSLC, it is a linked lifecycle data concept 
all the different tools keeps their own logic and data, and data uh, artifacts are linked to make a context for the full life cycle, which this uh, metaphorish picture shows here. And if you want to learn more, I recommend you to go to the uh, webpage that Sean showed before, showed before, the OpenServices.net webpage. Next slide, please. And a bit of the pros and cons. So, for the user organization, again, this is tool vendor agnostic. It doesn't forces you to use a certain vendor. But there is, of course, some limitations to what tools are supported with OSLC. And there's basically two kinds of tools, the tools that are OSLC na enabled natively, uh, already by the provider themselves. And uh, there are uh, a handful, primarily from IBM and uh, some others, open source. And we would like to see more vendors coming on board, of course, but there, there is a bit of a limitation there. To ease that, there has now been quite many uh, adapters or wrappers for other commercial tools made uh, providing OSLC. Uh, but that will not give you the full richness of all OSLC capabilities necessarily. So that's something to keep in mind. Then on the positive side again, it's an open standard. And in Ericsson, we like open standards. We've been active in in Linux and uh, in Eclipse and other standards over the years, and that has been very uh, beneficial to us in many aspects. But since it's a standard, it also gives that a good thing that we now have a common understanding of artifacts. So that allows us to do index-based reporting instead of copying data, just knowing where the data reside and fetch it from the data source instead. However, and uh, that is both a beauty and a challenge to OSLC, it's a light specification, just as Sean presented it in the beginning. The beauty about that is that uh, it enabled OSLC to take off. It was easy for tool vendors to get on board and, and to get going with OSLC. But it also has its backside that it's not that stringent in, in data model and definition of all artifacts. So there are it leaves quite much room for interpretation. So um, there is a discussion now if that should be more done in this direction, and some companies are looking into that as well. But that should be bearing in mind that even though I said an apple is an apple and is an apple, there are still different flavors of apples. Again, no data copy. We have a single source of data, very good thing. But the problem then kind of moves to link health instead. So we need to manage our links over time, and uh, that means that uh, if we move a server, since this is uh, uh, URL-based or HTTP-based, uh, HTTP I mean, uh, we may need to reroute links and so on to keep the ecosystem vibrant. And again, a positive thing, the rich hovering in UI delegate that it provides capabilities and logic from different tools to be exposed in the other tool. And that is really the good thing that the, helps us avoiding this copying or duplication of uh, uh, capabilities between tools. However, backside again, that means that you will now, as a user, be exposed to different look and feel. So that's a bit of a context switch when you move into the different UI delegates. So the, the context from tool B will be viewed in tool A. And if tool B have different states, you as a user will have to interpret the two different set of states in your head and, and make some uh, rationale about that. The rich hovering, though, gives the same look and feel, but not the, the full UI delegate where all the capabilities exist. From an IT person's point of view, it's very good that it's based on standard URL REST technology. It makes uh, deployment of this very easy. Um, and uh, it's also very easy for the IT people to adapt the, the, the internal tools, the, the legacy tools the company has because of the ability for the SDK 
which is the Eclipse Lio project, uh, which were developed with an SDK and with some example projects, also what was presented by Sean in the beginning. That's a good thing. Um, then there is a bit of challenge with the adapters and the quality of those. Uh, perhaps it will improve uh, as the ecosystem around OSLC uh, evolves, but uh, initially there has been challenges to have the adapters uh, coming out with the same timing as the other tools, third-party tools, are uh, coming up with new releases. Some, some of the tools comes quite frequently, and they change their native APIs, which means that the mapping towards an OSLC adapter has to be rewritten by someone. And also to bear in mind is when we have a landscape where we need to remote access many different tools, the users will have to have access in all of these tools. So there might be multiple tool license costs uh, to be aware about. It depends a bit on what lo my lo license model you use. If there's a corporate license, that's not a big issue, but if it's uh, per user, that could be concerning to some. When you sync, you will only need the licenses for the set of uses that uses a specific tool. And then, of course, you have the license of the sync tool as well. Okay, that was the pros and cons on link, and then at last I will take next slide, the utopia scenario. So, as I wrote in my, my teaser for this speech, perhaps it's not worth it, it's too complicated, let's give up, let's agree on selecting one tool and use that for everything we need, and standardize on that tool throughout the full project. Well, there are a few cases in the industry where I heard about this being successful. Uh, normally it's smaller companies or it is in consultants groups that anyhow are using the tools of their clients while they have another set of tools internally when they're not running with clients. So uh, if there were a tool that had all the type of user interfaces you would desire, all the type of capabilities you could could think of that you need and all the type of data artifacts you really need, well, then you're quite well off, actually, because um, uh, these tools are, um, then you will get it self-contained into one tool. Uh, now, the challenge is that most of the tools are not capable of all these things at the time. Um, but there are also vendors that think they are very close to this. And what they do, and if you click again, is that they provide some type of platform that they claim can be extended to connect up the few missing pieces that you would need to have. And I should be honest with you, there are some good platforms around in the industry. So if you are in a situation where there, you get 90 or 80% of all what you need, out of one tool vendor, or at least the suite of the one tool vendor with a platform that groups that together, it might still be worth considering. However, in most of the projects I work in larger corporation, it looks more as what's on the next slide. Take the next. So this is how we have it in Ericsson. We have loads of different tools, not necessarily only these ones. There are many others. Uh, these are more like examples that we have to um, live with of different reasons. And the good reasons might be that we have done mergers and acquisitions and we've got more than one tool in and we can't migrate at once. We have tools that are legacy in the new and we can't do transformation at once. Uh, or it will take a couple of years. We may have tools for customer near relationship and team internal relation uh, collaboration, and they need to coexist. And then there is a few, or quite more actually nowadays, bad reason that we haven't really managed to agree within a project, and we have selected very different tools in different teams. One can argue if that is healthy, and perhaps that drives more cost and benefit, and, and also a bit of inefficiency because of all these contexts. But th the reality has it that we have all these different tools. 
And even if we could get rid of the bad reasons for having multiple tools, we would still remain with a number of good reasons for having multiple tools. So our reality is that we have many life cycle tools, some capturing part of the life cycle, some more, some less. And we need some way to integrate with them. So to quite some extent, uh, having a one single solution for the life cycle becomes a utopia for most organizations, and some level of integration and, uh, is needed. And the more we go towards automation, towards DevOps, uh, continuous deployment, having customer requirements coming fast into the teams, um, the more we need to have tools well integrated and roll up the data to both the teams themselves and to product managers and people on higher level to be able to monitor and view what goes on so that uh, corrective actions can be taken in, in proper time. All that drives the need for integration. And that's actually my last slide. So the next slide is just the questions and answer at, uh, placeholder. So thank you. That was my thinking. And uh, I now ask Sean to open up the bridge so we can perhaps perhaps have some questions and answers. Oh, that's, thank you very much, Matt. I think that was an excellent overview of kind of the state of the enterprise when it comes to creating uh, and managing I, IT and software projects, and also you know building anything at all, whether it's uh, in software or a uh, embedded type product. I very much enjoyed your your presentation. As Thank you said, you. I'm going to open up the line. I'm going to unmute it so that anyone can ask questions here, as well as uh, look in the chat to see if anyone's typed questions there. So here. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. Yes, All right, so if you have questions, questions uh, speak up, please. And hopefully the slides were proceeding while we were going. Well. I could see them, so they, they were proceeding. Okay, very good. Could I ask a question to the audience? Is there anyone that recognizes these type of thinking concerns and challenges around thinking and link, uh, cons well, pros and cons and, and thinking? They're all very shy. Or they all agree or? Uh, <laughs> They don't yeah. recognize. Or if you want to ask me any other generic question on our journey on, on the integration with Ericsson, most welcome. We get a chat here. Yeah, so here's a question from the chat. Uh, what solutions would you propose to handle link health over time? An excellent question. And, uh, Actually, we don't know. Um, there, there, there is one thing which has not come from OSLC. It's actually in our collaboration with IBM and uh, that uh, when a server will be moved to uh, another uh, URL location that there is some kind of uh, rerouting route, mechanism involved. Uh, but that's more on a technical level how to work with um, that you need to change your allocation. But we have also asked ourselves what happens when tools uh, loses their connection to, to certain links and, and so on. Uh, that might be an area where also some of the um, synchronization vendors may have some thinking on, on, on providing some support there. Uh, but I haven't seen anything yet myself. Perhaps someone else has an answer there. So I know that this is uh, you know, an area that inside of IBM is being worked on, and I, I think in 
some of the implementations of OSLC from Tivoli, which would be more to the operations side. Um, they, they have taken some different approaches, including um, including not storing uh, dir the direct links so that it's almost a, you could have a link proxy and coding for the fact that a link itself could change in the actual implementation. Uh, so in some ways, a lot of the challenges, I think, around link health um, have been made worse by, um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, just maybe the first time you're implementing a new piece of technology and you still need to learn um, what the best practices are around it. Mm. Uh, but it, regardless, no matter what you do, there is a there is a challenge there uh, that yeah. uh, you need to manage. Yeah, the challenge doesn't necessarily go away in a sync scenario either because it's about health in your uh, relation between two artifacts. And and that needs to be maintained also in the sync scenario. So if, if there is many um, poor uh, or old uh, links or syncs between two artifacts, they still need certain maintenance and, and, and gardening over time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and it's a potential uh, strategy there, I, I suppose, might involve some, some level of archiving of information. Um, yes. But in a way, that's a bit of an open question still. The best practices yes, are still to be discovered. <laughs> We may have time for yet another question to see if I can answer. So here's a question. Which of all the tools you showed did you integrate with Think or OSLC? And I'll, I'll lift that uh, chart back up. Right. So if you look at this and you make it large as well, um, where we started off in Ericsson uh, uh, was to integrate, uh, uh, we were at that time, two years ago, uh, deploying the JAS CLM suite. So uh, the RTC tool uh, were connected to an internal tool that we have for customer defects called MHWeb. You can see it as number two on the third line. Uh, modification handling web. So, so RTC to JAS. Uh, sorry, RTC JAS to image web. And we did that with the defect work item type in RTC towards something, an object called trouble report in image web. And um, that initially we did in a syncing way, actually using OSLC. We used OSLC with Sync, which is a bit of an odd implementation and had a bit of the side effect that immediately our creative engineers in the team started to modify the business logic in RTC to replicate all the logic of MHWeb. And that's where we realized that we were on a dangerous path and stopped that because we were almost re-implementing MHWeb. And that was not really the purpose and we were a bit afraid that RTC would become a much more heavy, high ceremony tools with many states and CCB checks, etc. So we stopped that and instead went for the real type of OSLC implementation, how it's intended, with a linking strategy. And it works fine now. We have both a provider consumer in image web and we can do uh, rich hover and UI delegate from within RTC. And I also believe we have done it for RQM now as well. Uh, what uh, still is the thing is that there's a slightly context switch in the user interface for the end user. But uh, we, we don't find that more challenging than that you have to use two tools on a regular basis. Most, most developers are using one on one tool. So that's what we've done. Okay, that, that's very good, and I will... Um, that was our first, and we, we were working on a few others, but yeah. that, that's our biggest um, experience in that area. You know, just looking at this list uh, and comparing it with the, the list of 
software I know that implements OSLT natively or has adapters for it. Uh, there might be, there's only a handful on here that actually have OSLT support, whether natively or through, uh, or through uh, an adapter. And I think that mm. that is one of the uh, one of the other things. Just as we're now at the uh, top of the hour again, but I do know that um, uh, that many enterprise end users do to help fix that uh, state of things, as they are always talking about their need for OSLC-based integrations whenever they speak to the many many other vendors that they deal with, as the uh, as Ericsson is showing here, or as Matt is showing here. So with that, I, as I said, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, Matt, I'd like to thank you again for a excellent uh, presentation today, and I would like to thank everyone else for, who's joined us uh, live and who may be watching the recording later. As you can see, there are a number of uh, webcasts coming up just within the next uh, eight days. And there will also be a OSLC webcast uh, in July. Uh, that is still to be uh, announced, but if you watch here, maybe sign up to receive emails when, uh, when webcasts are announced. You'll certainly be aware of it. And uh, we do, as is the case with today, try to make all these things available on the OSLC YouTube channel. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed the presentation and found it useful. Uh, thanks again, Matt, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.